I am taking a break and you can't stop me. I am currently exhausted, and if you watched the last video, you will know why. I ended up getting four 99s while captaining for UIM Summer Splashdown 2024. I got 99 fishing shortly before the event started, then ran through my noted fish from Temporos for 99 cooking, then I spent about 60 hours total making 580,000 broad arrows at pest control for 99 fletching, and then I decided to just knock out 98 to 99 farming at Tithe Farm. I currently have 15 skills at level 99, and I have just eight more left before I'm maxed. So as you can see, the one I've decided to do next is woodcutting, and that's because it has a really nice AFK method, Redwoods. The method is extremely simple. You just click the tree, and it takes about 20 seconds on average to get a log, but when you get one, it gives about 400 XP. And not only that, a recent update made this method even nicer. When Jackx released Forestry, they reworked how the depletion mechanics work for woodcutting. So instead of trees having a random chance to be cut down when you chop a log, they now have a timer that ticks down when you're chopping it. So that makes it really consistent. I'll click on the redwood tree and then my character will keep chopping for about four and a half minutes until it depletes. So basically I can get 70K woodcutting experience per hour while only interacting with the game every five minutes or so. So I can do things like watching a movie or playing on my main or playing a different video game entirely while I'm still getting a halfway decent XP rate. So that's why I'm choosing to do redwoods for 99. Yes, there are other methods that can go over 200K XP per hour, but right now I'm just trying to take a break. I am engaging second monitor mode on my UIM. I've been doing this for a while while I was editing the last video and in the meantime since, and I'm currently about 80% of the way from 97 to 98 woodcutting. So it should be around like 20 to 25 hours of this to get to 99, which in the grand scheme of things, isn't too bad of a grind, especially when it's entirely AFK. There's 98 woodcutting, let's take it home. All right, with this last tree, that is gonna be 99 woodcutting number 16 on the account. The woodcutting cape has one benefit, which is that it gives a 10% increase to the chance of getting a bird nest when chopping trees, which isn't really that useful in the slightest uh, because who in their right minds continues woodcutting after 99? I said who in their right minds. I've been thinking about what I want to do at this point now that I feel like I've had enough of a break from the game, and I think I have an idea for something that could get me back into the rhythm of things. I went ahead and did this quest on my main just so I know what I'm getting into on the UIM, so this isn't really like blind by any means, but I'm still excited to knock this one out on the UIM. Alright, the easy stuff is done now, but I know this quest gets pretty difficult, especially for a UIM. Uh, for this part, I gotta run through this dungeon with a ton of hostile NPCs who attack with all three combat styles, so I'm gonna need to tank a ton of damage, but if I understand this right, once I get across here... Yeah, everything in this little area is melee only, so I can just pray melee and kill this one elite Black Knight for the armor. And there we go, full Black Knight armor, and if I enter wearing it, nothing is gonna be aggressive to me. Awesome. 
Okay, well, I'm about to start the Sorok fight, and I thought that I was going to take advantage of a change they made a couple weeks after the quest released, which is that you can now store the Dark Squall robes and the Elite Black Knight armor in the POH, uh, since I was thinking, like, if I die during the fight, I can just pull the Elite Black Knight armor out and then use that to run back to my death pile, but apparently you just keep it on death anyway, so I guess it didn't really matter at all. <laughs> Though it does mean uh, I can keep both sets after the quest, uh, which is a nice little unlock, uh, kind of like the RD Knight outfit from Song of the Elves. For the actual fight, I'm going to be taking advantage of an obscure feature of my code I won, which is that it's not just for auto-casting ancient spells, it can also auto-cast standard and Arceus spells, and it still gives a 15% chance for increased damage and negated rune costs. Uh, this boss fight is kind of a gimmick fight, where you have to use a bunch of spells on the standard spellbook, so using the code I won helps a lot with that. I'm auto-casting Water Wave, because uh, they recently put a change into the game that makes all the elemental spells do the same damage, and the code I won gives unlimited water runes so I'll just have to manual cast the other spells when he does his special attacks. Uh, I know this doesn't count as actually being like in the wilderness, but it's still like making me really nervous. You know, I keep hearing that this quest is proof that old school like stole the idea of killing a major NPC from RS2, but like when they did it in Monkey Madness 2, it kind of like hit harder. I guess just because it's like one NPC and it happens to be the Slayer Master that you've likely been grinding with to get to level 69 for the quest. It just doesn't really like hit as hard when they're like, here's six major NPCs from around the game and they're all dead now. Surprise! Okay, this part of the quest is the one that I thought was going to be a nightmare on the UIM, but actually it looks like it's not going to be that bad, uh, since you really only need the materials for the one statue that you're working on at the moment, so the inventory management really isn't that bad. Ooh boy, the uh, balance elemental. This fight was really rough when I was doing it on the main, but I actually have a lot better gear and stats on the UIM, so hopefully that makes up for the lack of inventory space. I have near max range and mage, and even though melee is my worst combat style by far, I do have a thing I can use. And there we go, the Tormented Demon fight isn't going to be nearly as bad since it's more of a tutorial for the post-quest version of them, and you get the in-quest benefit of having your stats maxed out at 255. And that's it, while Guthic Sleeps is done. Honestly, this is my least favorite Grandmaster quest by far, uh, but it does go to show how much better the old school team is at writing their own stories and designing their own quests, instead of just like pulling things out of RS2. I actually kind of hope that the reaction to this quest uh, sort of signals to Jagex that they should probably be putting more resources into original quests, since those basically always turn out way more interesting and fun than the ports from RS2. Uh, anyway, I got a good amount of Herblor XP from that, 75 k to be exact, which actually does put a pretty major dent in the slow crawl to having 99 Herblor bagged. Uh, I also got XP and Thieving, Farming, and Hunter, but I already have those at 99. So what now? I feel like it's probably time to go back to some skilling and get another 99, and I think the next one I want to go for is crafting. I'm currently 96, so three levels to go on that, and it should be pretty chill. I think the main method I'm going to use for this is just your standard charter ship crafting. It's real simple, you just buy sand and soda ash from the charter ship, and you cast super glass make and blow them into glass orbs, and then you drop them. It's a lot of world hopping, and there's actually a method you can do to speed up that world hopping process. It involves like using two client windows but it's a bit more active and it doesn't increase the XP per hour that much, so I'll just be staying on one client. So yeah, I think I'm going to be just chilling out here at the charter ship doing this for a while. Uh, it should be like 30 to 40 hours of charter ship crafting for 99. Oh, wait, I forgot something. There we go, gotta have that. There's 98 crafting that's going to be the last unlock since that's the level where you can make Zenite amulets. Uh, it's funny finally actually getting to this level since I originally made my amulet of torture over two years ago by boosting from level 93, and now I'm finally getting the level to do that unboosted. And this should be the last inventory 99 crafting, number 17 out of 23, just six more to go. The crafting cape is legitimately one of the most useful 99 capes in the game. 
for anyone other than a UIM. The perk is that it gives unlimited teleports to the crafting guild, which seems kind of normal and not very interesting, but that teleport happens to be the fastest unlimited teleport to a bank. The imbued enchanted liar can technically get you closer to the bank and Nada's not, but it has a four tick delay during the teleport animation, so the crafting cape is faster. A lot of players who aren't maxed yet will just carry a crafting cape and a construction cape on them at all times, since having unlimited bank teleports and unlimited POH teleports is basically all you need for teleports in any content, really. But of course, for UIMs, this perk isn't too useful. Um, it could theoretically be nice for unnoting things, but I already have the diary cape, uh, which I can use to teleport to Jar, which is just about as fast. Uh, that's actually what I used when I was going through all my pure essence a while back and turning them into nature runes, since I had to teleport to a bank to unnote every inventory of essence, and I was already using the diary cape for the teleport to the nature altar. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and take a bit of a break from the maxing grind here, because I'm not gonna lie, I've been dealing with some burnout in the game recently, and I need to just like push through it. So I think something that'll get my motivation up is catching up on the new quests that got added to the game with the Varlamore part two update. I'm gonna start off with the main story related quest that got added, which is the Heart of Darkness. I'm actually kinda excited for this one uh, because the previous one, Twilight's Promise, was pretty interesting story-wise, but got weighed down a lot by all the tutorials they had to throw in for the different activities in Varlamore. Ah, so this is a bit annoying. Uh, they added a new Quetzal landing site for this area, but I'm not really ever going to get any more of the Quetzal feeds since I'm done with 99 Hunter now, so I'm just going to be walking from the other one. Uh, there is a boss here that you can fight after the quest, so I guess if I ever need to grind that out, I may do a bit of Hunter to get the feed to unlock it, but I don't think that's really likely. Hmm. Spot the protagonist. I do like what they're doing with the story here. I like the new dimension for the twins being like central figures in the Twilight Emma series. Uh, the last quest was setting up for them to just be like mad that they were born into the wrong family or something. It was not the temple that called to her, but what lies below? Oh wait, I've already done that quest. So just like the Wild Guthic Sleeps quest, the unique outfit for this quest is storable in the POH, so I can just keep that forever. All right, this boss isn't bad at all. Uh, it's basically like another Scurrius. It's meant to tutorialize like a few boss mechanics, but this one seems like it'll be easier for new players since you don't need to worry about switching prayers or anything. Cool, that is the end of the quest. Definitely not bad at all. Uh, I like how the story is developing, but I'm not sure how exactly they're gonna be able to wrap this up in one more story quest without it being like a master quest or something. Uh, anyway, next up is Death on the Isle, which is the murder mystery quest they were teasing at the Summer Summit, so I guess it's time to see what's up with that. Uh, this is another one of those quests that holds your items for you like Desert Treasure 2 did for the Ice Dungeon portion. And I know there's like no way that anything could go wrong with this, but it's still like, it makes me nervous as a UIM, knowing that all my stuff is technically like nowhere right now. And there's that quest done. Uh, honestly, kind of like whatever, you know, it seems like a bit of a repeat because there's already a couple murder mystery quests in the game. So for this one, the butler outfit is storable in the POH, but none of the other cosmetics are, uh, like the masks and the butler tray, which is unfortunate. You can also get the costumer's needle, which lets you craft things without using thread, which I guess is a really niche use if you're ever gonna be like making a lot of dehyde bodies or something on a main, since it'd let you make another one per inventory, but it's basically useless on a UIM. Next up is Meet and Greet, and this is the other one that has any sort of boss fight in it. All right, well, uh, that sure was a Minotaur fight, I guess. Um, I'm basically at the end of this quest now. It gives access to Varlamorian kebabs, which are slightly better than normal kebabs because they don't have a chance to drain stats like normal ones do, but I don't really imagine them ever being useful since cheese potatoes are viable from the Warrior's Guild anyway. That's the quest done, and this last one is basically the joke quest of this batch, kind of like the frog quest in the last one ethically acquired antiquities. Man, I am literally 99 crafting as of yesterday. I feel like I should just be able to patch these up myself. Oh God, <laughs> first person jump scare. I don't think like any quest has ever done a first person perspective like this, at least for like a conversation. All right, that's all the new quests done. And that was a nice little break, I guess. But uh, this next skill is gonna be a doozy. So this is my Google Doc that I use for tracking a lot of stuff on the UIM, stuff that I want to be able to easily look up later, my to-do list, things like that. I just finished up crafting and the Varlamore quests, and you'll see that the next thing on my list is blocked by a notepad. So if I pull that away, you'll see that it's blocked by a RuneLight client. But if I pull that away, you'll see that it's blocked by the script for this video. But if I pull that away, you'll see that it's blocked by a calculator app. But if I pull that away, <sighs> The next 99 is gonna be RuneCraft, 
and it's going to be the longest one on the maxing grind, 85 hours of Guardians of the Rift. Let's get started. So first off, I need to reobtain my Colossal Pouch. Uh, thankfully, it's basically an account unlock. If you've ever gotten the Abyssal Needle on your account, you can just use a normal needle on the Reward Guardian to turn it into another Abyssal Needle. So now I just need to get all four runecrafting pouches again, and then I'll be good to turn them into another Colossal Pouch. There we go, got the last one after 108 KC. Uh, that's pretty lucky for this. Uh, you normally expect to get all four after about like 168 KC. So let's talk about Guardians of the Rift. A few years ago, it was a really common sentiment that RuneCraft was the worst skill in the game. The mantra was, Swamp Man good, RuneCraft bad. So in early 2022, Jackax decided to tackle that by creating a new RuneCraft minigame called Guardians of the Rift, which was meant to provide an alternate method to training the skill that was more XP per hour than blood runecrafting, but less active than lava runecrafting, and also gave a lot of good rewards. And for UIMs, Guardians of the Rift had an even bigger impact. It's not common for UIMs to have a really big stack of pure essence that could take them all the way to 99, so we need to use methods that don't require pure essence. Historically, that has been blood runecrafting crafting or the Arceus library. And yeah, that means that the Arceus library has historically been the best method for UIMs all the way to 99. But now that we have Guardians of the Rift, that's the new best method. Technically, the library gives more XP per hour still since they buffed the XP rates at the beginning of this year, but it's still definitely worth it to do Guardians of the Rift instead, since it's still roughly the same XP and you get a ton of runes that you can sell for money. This is going to secure my cash stack for the rest of the maxing grind and also give me a ton of extra money for things like fueling the Tumic and Shadow going forward. So just like Temporos, I'm going to at least start off with some masses to get the hang of it again. Uh, I think it's possible I might try out some stuff with small teams since it does give more XP per hour, but it'll be a lot more coordinated, so I'm not really sure if I'll end up doing that. The way that Guardians of the Rift works is that everything revolves around the Great Guardian in the center. He starts at 10% health, and once you get him to 100%, you win. But if he gets to 0%, you lose, and you don't get any rewards. The whole time, Abyssal creatures are coming out of the Rift at the top of the arena, and they'll start to damage the Great Guardian if they ever get to him, so that's what can lower his health. There are ways to keep the Abyssal creatures from getting to the Great Guardian, like building barriers in front of him or creating new guardians to fight them off, but the main thing that you're doing in the game is crafting runes. The minigame has a special essence mine that you can use to craft guardian essence, and you can go through the portals in the area to reach the different rune crafting altars, and you can turn them into runes, but it also gives you a byproduct, guardian stones. You can give those to the Great Guardian, and it fills up his health bar, so most of the game revolves around choosing when to go mine more essence, when to craft runes, and when to build guardians and barriers as the team slowly gets the health bar to 100%. This is my loadout, by the way. I've already done a good amount of Guardians of the Rift on this account, so I've already unlocked the Abyssal Needle as well as the whole rune crafting outfit, which gives me 60% extra runes. I also got the Abyssal Lantern previously, but it's not storable and I had to drop it, so I think my first major goal during the grind is going to be getting another Lantern as quickly as possible. It's going to make the rest of the 99 grind a lot easier. Another big consideration is what runes I'm going to keep, uh, since UIMs can't just deposit everything into the bank like everyone else can. Uh, I'm going to be keeping the valuable ones like blood runes, death runes, law runes, and nature runes, but I'm also going to be keeping chaos runes so that I won't have to buy them later when I'm charging the shadow. So this is going to be my life now for the foreseeable future. This is going to be the single biggest challenge on the way to maxing the account. Everything will be downhill from here. So in the next video, I will be diving into this grind and taking out the biggest hurdle in front of me. I'll see you then. Wait, hold on. Something happened when I was editing this video. I got the Abyssal Lantern that is incredibly lucky. This thing is a one in 700 drop from the Rewards Guardian, but they changed it last year so you can just buy it for 1500 pearls if you get really unlucky. But that's not gonna end up mattering because I managed to get it in less than 50 reward pulls. That is wild. The Abyssal Lantern is an offhand item that gives buffs for this minigame specifically, depending on what logs you use to light it. So you can get more points with U logs, more runes with magic logs, stuff like that. But I'm going to be using redwood logs, which makes it so that your pouches never degrade. That's going to be really nice for this grind because it's really annoying when the pouch degrades in the middle of a round. It's going to make it a lot more brain off, which is exactly what I'm looking for with an 85 hour grind. Well, with that all taken care of, this grind is going to be a lot nicer now that I got the lantern back at the very beginning, and I'll see you in the next video.